very happy to introduce Jamie. And Jamie was a, he is, is a resident of South Royalton and also was a staff member at South Royalton. Currently teaches, uh, sorry, is a principal at Williamstown for seven years. Um, five years in the elementary and then the last two he added on in high school as well, seven through 12. And um, he now consults across Vermont on the multi-tier multi system of support, which is a system to help incorporate all students' learning. And um, I think, what did you say, nine supervisory unions? 19. 19, a, okay, 19 yeah. supervisory unions across the state. After that, I'm gonna let him do the talking because he's better at telling about himself than I. <laughs> so there's, there's three new faces that haven't really in here, that haven't really heard kind of the why well, like, why did I apply to White River Valley? And then specifically, what do I see the role as the superintendent? Because I think that can be different from superintendent to superintendent. So I just thought I'd start there and then open it up to questions. Does that sound okay? So the why is, I've been at uh, Williamstown for seven years, as was said, and um, I've done some work the last year and a half in the supervisory union office there and be able to get a great deal of training, which I've been, I feel um, really fortunate to have had. And so with that, I started to recognize this idea of how much I enjoy system level work. And that had led me about three years ago to start doing work through the Higher Ed Collaborative and now the Vermont Principals Association in partnership with the Higher Ed Collaborative, consulting work in SUs around this idea of distributed leadership and how do you utilize distributed leadership to make a comprehensive system of supports, a multi-tiered system of supports is what we call it in regards to ensuring all students ha have what they need to reach their greatest potential. Specifically around high quality universal instruction that meets 80 to 85% of our students' needs, and then targeted intervention, and an event which would be small, small group, but prescriptive intervention, and eventually intensive intervention for students who may need a more intensive one-to-one -one prescribed intervention, both either social, emotional, or academic. And so going through that work, um, I realize how much I truly do enjoy this idea of creating a comprehensive system that brings folks together for common ends, but also recognizing what I found is, as I was doing work in SUs, that folks felt like that meant they, could, they would lose their identity as schools, because we also had this thing called Act 46 that required us to merge. And so what I've seen is, is folks have been, I think, a bit more resistant almost around centralized work at the SU level since that, because they're worried about losing local control. And so my work started to become more about how do you differentiate what is SU level work versus school level work? And how do we work together to make sure we're still meeting SU level goals, which are ends for all students, but also make certain that schools feel like they haven't lost their identity. And so with that, this position opened up and uh, I did a lot of wrestling originally about whether or not I was going to apply to this position. And I finally came down to that why I was wrestling with it was less about me personally and more about my staff and students and community in Williamstown. And so what I decided was is that I would regret this 10 years from now if I didn't pursue this opportunity. I was born and raised here in South Royalton. I've worked in four different schools here within the SU in different ways and done some consulting work here with some schools here in this SU and felt like the work that has happened and the foundation that's been laid has set this place up for great success. So I think the time's ripe. Um, I feel like I have the skills to work with the team that we have in place and to empower educators to continue to do good work and to work with the board so that we can really meet our strategic plan and mission and vision. Because there's a really good plan laid out. I think part of it is we need to reflect back on the plan, do some revisions to the plan, potentially, maybe narrow our focus for a little bit, continue to find some wins. Like there's been a huge literacy initiative that's taken place. And as I was in schools today, all I heard is how proud folks were about that. But that was a hyper-focused initiative and there was a lot of professional learning provided to it and support. And so how do we learn from that to continue to leverage change? And that's what excites me about the position. So that is the why. The role of the superintendent, I sort of got to a bit. I think it is about how do you work with the community, 
with students, with teachers, and administration to make the job of an educator easier, but also to meet those goals. And by meeting those goals, it's ensuring that we have the right professional learning, ensuring that we have the right resources for teachers to put in front of kids, and how do we do that in an efficient way and cost-effective way. And I think that that's really at the heart of the role of the superintendent, as well as ensuring that we all are headed down to the same end. And that takes continued conversation and relationship building and refocus, right? It's, it's no different than it in the classroom, this idea of the cycle of assessment, right? Like a formative to a summative, but a summative turns into an informative because it informs future instruction. We don't say the student didn't learn it, so we stopped teaching it. Right, just because it was a summative. It's the same thing with the whole school system. It's all right, we got this plan. How are we assessing the plan? How are we revising the plan and keeping the focus on the plan? And you know, one of the ways I'd like to do that is by getting the focus on how are we measuring student success? And I think there's lots of means to do it, but I think we need to develop what are those means, and that's what we need to share and celebrate. The other thing I I'm, I'm, feel like I, I'm strong at is how do you have a proactive dialogue with the community? I think there's things happen in every one of these schools that we should be incredibly proud of. I live right in South Royalton. I'm in the education community. I saw a bunch of things today I had no idea was happening. I mean, I think it behooves us to celebrate that and get that out there so that we're not reacting to the conversation, but it's a proactive conversation that we're saying, look at all the things we're offering students. And then eventually that results in us attracting young families, which I think is really important for us for sustainability. So that's, that's a bit about me, and I totally would take any questions. You talked about the social emotional um, piece, and I know that you have done um, some collaboration in Williamstown. Knowing that there's trauma-based kids and we're having more and more problems, I work in South Burlington, so I see it a lot. I also do special ed, so I see another side of it. Um, is there some kind of goal to, to get some kind of program similar to what you have established in Williamstown along with, and I'm, I don't know all the specifics of the names, but um, to get more counselors and to get more help for these kids so that we can provide them security so that they can have a learning environment. Is that something that you see happening within these schools? I heard it's a desire, and I think there's pockets of some schools trying some things, but I think we gotta create some type of outcome-based plan at the, at the SU level that says, all right, Part of creating a multi-tiered system of supports is having a strong universal system for social emotional learning. And I think schools can decide what that looks like. I don't think we have to be prescriptive about what you're going to do, we but you have to. PIS. Yeah, there you go. So we, we're, we're already like implementing that. I know Bethel has been doing that for quite a long time. Um, we have seen some results in South Wilton with it. Um, but I just I see where there's like even more need. Um, yeah, so, so there's things, not enough staff to, to, to help these kids, right. you know, and that's what's, what's, what's a little challenging at times. So I think you do two things at once. You build universal understanding around, around how do you become a therapeutic school around social emotional. And what I mean by that is part of being trauma informed is how do you build resiliency in students. We're not going to stop trauma, right, because they leave our buildings. But what I think we can do is build resilient learners. And what we know about that is relationship building. But in addition, I think teachers need tools of how to take care of themselves, right? Because compassion fatigue is a thing. And every day I got to bring my best, especially folks on the front lines. And so you do that through self-regulation strategies around mindfulness. I think you do it through responsive classroom and common approach to instruction around social emotional. I think you do it by... I've seen a lot of success in Garcia Winner's work around social cognition. It's a lot of th practices that you, I think you already have in place in your restorative um, classrooms that should be happening universally. And so, but that's going to take time. But I think you start with one initiative. And by initiative, that word's sort of sometimes looked down upon in education. But it really is an initiative. It's saying, just like literacy, this is going to be a hyper-focus for us over the next three years, and we're not going to take our eye off it. 
And so I think what we got to say is universally, what's going to be the common approach? Like, what are, our, what are our expectations for students? Are they clear and posted? Are we all acknowledging students on them? So some common practices that way. And then in addition to teachers feeling like they have the tools to help the students start to identify when they're dysregulated. And then once you start to identify you're dysregulated, you're building this toolkit for teachers and students to be able to access. But what it can't be is just one person is the social emotional teacher. We all have to be. And that's what I mean by universal, like everyone. So like when we teach a social emotional lesson, my school cook teaches the social emotional lesson too because it's just important for them to understand what it means when a student's in the yellow zone as it is for me or my school secretary or, you know, my fifth grade math teacher. And so you do that over time, but I think it's that focusing on universal. While though, you gotta put some band-aids on things. And what I mean by that is you gotta have some interventions, right? Because we got some students who are struggling and they're, they're trying to escape classrooms. And so what type of behavior plans could you put in place to better reinforce either attention-seeking behaviors or stop escape behaviors? Because the function of most kids at behaviors at elementary are those two things. They either want attention or they want to escape. And so we got to figure out that the band-aid to me is let's put the behavior plan in place and execute it with fidelity. And oh, it has to be done with fidelity or other, otherwise we're not going to know if it works. And then meanwhile, though, we're trying to give kids tools. And those tools over time is going to be what makes the difference. But that takes time. Yeah. Yeah. But that takes time. You know, so you do, you do get to have these other tools to keep kids in the classroom so they're learning, because that's the other issue too, right? If kids, students learn how to escape, then what that becomes is now we have such an achievement gap for students, then of course they want to escape, and it becomes a reinforced behavior, right? So I escape because I don't feel like I know what's going on because I've escaped the last three years. So actually, I feel safe in my building now, but I don't want to be in the classroom because I feel like I don't know what's going on instructionally. And so that's the other thing, right? So the more we can keep kids in early intervention, continue to feel, uh, fill academic gaps, then the more success we'll have. And universal like education for all staff? Yeah, yeah not just teachers. Yeah, all staff. So like any time we do an initiative, it's all. So when we do mindfulness, all staff. When we do social cognition, all staff. I know the funding is always an issue with that. And so that's, you know, it, it's hard to be able to. Well, you know, I, I've said earlier, like, funding is an issue until you realize what efficiencies can you find to reinvest. Right? So I, I, I'm sure that we are putting some interventions and supports in for students that if universally we all had better tools, that we wouldn't need those. Like, like really intensive supports that can cost the upwards of sixty, seventy thousand dollars potentially that could be reinvested in professional learning, and so I'm all about not let's cut things and to cut it. It's about what efficiencies can we find to then reinvest back into the system, and when you start to do that, what you start to find is you reinvest back into all kids and not just ten or fifteen percent of kids. And, but up front, you gotta, you got to be willing to say, all right, we've got to make some tough decisions because we've got to invest in this. I was going to say that um, I told you this earlier when you came into the classroom. This is the most excited, energetic faculty I've ever worked with in my entire career, um, having been at several schools. Um, and, and hearing you talk about this, we actually have a group of people that get together with our front, the person at the front desk you know, health teachers, our, our PBIS person, and other teachers who come and volunteer to meet on Thursdays to talk about how we can do this exact thing. We're doing a book study, and we do this on our own. And we have several groups like that that work on identity as a middle school, that work on, you know, um, uh, developing middle grades institute programs that we want to go and study. Um, and we're just incredibly excited and energetic. And one of the things that we're very curious about, I'm, I'm very curious about um, in looking at a new superintendent is, how can you support 
that enthusiasm and what does it look like? And then also I'm just curious, like, what is something, an initiative that you are very excited or energetic about? Thanks. Um, so I think the, the best thing the superintendent can do is celebrate successes and make certain few people feel a true sense of accomplishment and acknowledgement. And so I think that's important. And I think if you model that, that trickles down, and then we all start doing it. And also making certain that teachers and principals and staff feel safe to take responsible risk, right? Because I want folks to be creative and to push the envelopes, right, in a responsible way. But status quo, we don't get better with. And so I think that that's something that a superintendent can do and empower folks to understand that change really does come from the bottom up. I believe that. And so that there's a system for distributed leadership that folks realize that they can make decisions around consensus and really look, as long as those align to their continuous improvement plans, that they can go and work on that and that they'll be supported in it. And so that's what I mean about buildings having identities in regards to if a building's really passionate about something, they should pilot that. As long as it goes back to the SU goals, not the task, but the overall overarching goals in the strategic plan, then more power to buildings to do that because we can learn from each other. The thing that I think most excites me is this idea of creating a system of supports that supports kids early on and make certain all kids reach their greatest potential. That is not a sprint, it's a marathon. But the idea that if we do early intervention with fidelity, that we could see students who often were classified with specific learning disabilities not be, that's really exciting to me. That also has to do with universal instruction too. And I also get excited about teachers who feel really confident in their craft and in their content and that they feel excited to come to work. This job is way too hard in education not to feel excited to come to work. And you know, I'm a big believer that principals are the keepers of climate in their buildings. And I think that the superintendent is the keeper of climate across the SU. And so I think that there's a lot to be done around how do you measure your effectiveness around how excited students and teachers are to come to school. We all, many of us get into teaching because we love kids. I, and I, I say many of us, I don't know if everyone loves kids, but certainly I expect everyone here to love kids. And because they like being at school. And I, there's so many things that hit our plates every day that make the job tough, that can take away from that. And so how we fill in our buckets, and that is, I want to come to work the next day. I appreciate you saying that. I feel like we've been through a lot of changes recently, for sure, whether it was the merger, um, you know, principals, and now, of course, with a superintendent and stuff. But I'd really like to see someone who can come in and do what you're saying, boost morale. I think we have some amazing teachers, some great staff. Um, I'm speaking specifically to White River Valley, but um, I just love, I want teachers to be excited to be there and the staff to be excited to be there because I think overall the students have really merged pretty well, um, but i just like to see a boost of morale for everybody. I think we need that right now. Thank you. It's, it's just so critical, so learning. And you can feel it when you're in a school. It doesn't take long. So I, I did a brief introduction before, and um, so I'm Jamie Canarney, I'm the candidate for the superintendent, and now we're just kind of into an informal question and answer. And then if no one has questions, I actually have some questions for stakeholders that are here, but um, do you have any questions, specific questions? You actually answered her first question, do you like kids? <laughs> that is why I'm in the business. But I have Betsy Donahue, this is my daughter Josie, and he's in the South Nice to meet you. And I didn't really get into the elementary end today at the South Roman School. Yeah, it, it was a busy day today. <laughs> How are you holding up? I'm feeling all right. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm feeling pretty good.
I want to add one more point onto that enthusiasm part, and then hearing what you're talking about, I, I'm really appreciating actually a lot of what you're talking about so far. Um, but just th this idea of enthusiasm with teachers, you know, the very first day that we started, and one of the reasons I decided to come work here, is Owen, you know, he would he would say, and I think kids know this and they believe this, and I think teachers live it, that he wants to make this the best school in North America. And I'm not sure if you've met with Owen or not, but he. He always, we have so many school yes. meetings where he talks about that and believes it, and we believe it, and it's, it's enough to where we believe it, and we want to see that carry up, you know, all the way through the top. That it's not just about being a good school; it's about being the best school, and um, and I think that's what inspires so many of us to to give even more. And it does lead to exhaustion, and you know, and we love our vacations and our breaks, but it's really important to us that that's the mentality that's leading us. Yeah, I think it's critical, and I think it's then critical, how are we communicating that out? Like I said, I saw so many great things today, and you have so many things going on that I don't think the community necessarily knows. I'm a community member right now, and I didn't know it, and I'm in education. And so I think we got to look at how we're doing that to celebrate the work we're doing, because I think there's really good work happening. Do you have any other questions? Are you sure? Oh, all right. Do you think it's, um, I think that one of the biggest struggles that I, I find as a parent and as, as someone um, who's, who's working with the kids is the time that they're with us, we have somewhat control over, but the time after that. And as a parent, you know, I mean, I have a son that's here in the middle school. I sometimes feel foreign to the middle school um, because I'm so involved in, in the elementary over in South Railton, but is is there a way to like, I mean, you can't make the parents come. It's not like, you know, feel the dreams, you build it, they will come kind of thing. But I think more education for the families and the parents is something that really could be utilized to be able to be able to connect with the community a little bit more and so that those parents feel a little bit more connected. I mean, I saw um, I didn't know, but Alicia Hanford is teaching a math class for parents tonight, and I think that's amazing. I had no idea about that kind of thing. So, like that, that idea of getting that word out in the community and getting that idea that these parents can be able to help their children a little bit more with their math or not feel so, you know, inferior to you know, mm -hmm. social studies or whatever they're learning about. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you think that there can be something? Um, done yeah. Here? Yeah, I've been, you know, we leverage social media a great deal right now when I'm out in Williamstown. We'll get like, sometimes we get 10,000 hits a week at the elementary school. And so that's a lot. Yeah, it is. As you, for a little school, as you share it out, yeah, that's a lot. And so, you know, one of the things that we've started thinking about is, same thing, we've done informational nights and we've posted them on Facebook. And so what we started doing is videotaping them like tonight, and posting them on social media. And some folks will utilize that. The other thing that we started talking about that we haven't launched yet, but I think makes some sense, is there's a real captive audience at sporting events. And you know, I've done coffees with the principals and things of that nature, and a few folks come, not many. But how do we leverage captive audiences to then say it's not an additional thing? Parents are busy too, right? And so how do we make ease of access to get that information. I think it's through technology, but I also think it's saying, hey, by the way, you're here for X. Let us quickly talk to you about what we're doing in social emotional and talk to you about what yellow, green, red, and blue zones mean for social cognition, right? And you could do that in five minutes. At least give a blip, and oh, if you want to learn more, here's a handout, and here's an upcoming info night or something like that. And so I think there's ways to leverage already captive audiences in order to get the information out. How do you see growing the breadth of programs that the schools offer, given how tight budgets are, and how much of a challenge it is to, to sort of create programming in that environment? So I think you start by saying, all right, where do we have efficiencies, or can we increase revenues or expenses? So I'll just give you an example. At the Williamstown High School two years ago, I had, I had 50 kids leaving my campus, approximately, to go to the tech center alone. 
because I, I have two, two, Barry Tech and Randolph Tech. We started surveying students and meeting with students saying, why are you leaving our campus? Because when students leave, revenue leaves with them. And so what we learned was is they just wanted more experiential learning. It wasn't a specific program. And so what we said is how, as a faculty and with students, because student voice is important in this process, what is it that we can build that you'll feel really interested in? And so we built something called a sustainability strand that's going to meet two and a half days a week. It's got three teachers in it, an English teacher, a biology teacher, an experiential learning teacher. And the idea is, and we've got a greenhouse, and we built the infrastructure around a pole barn, and we're going to have goats, and we're going to milk goats, and we're going to make cheese and soap, and we're going to have the, the greenhouse is going to raise, raise fresh produce, and we're going to have tilapia. And the idea for these students is they're going to give back to their community. Now, that's just one project. Some of the students want to do ag. Some of the other students have other ideas around sustainability. But what that resulted in, right now I currently only have two students signed up to go to Tech Center next year from my current 10th grade. So that is 13 students on average that I'm bringing back that I can reinvest in my building. I didn't raise the budget to do what I just said, right? I just, we got more efficient with the schedule and I was able to add a full-time environmental education teacher that was part-time prior but those 13 students more than paid for that. And then I could take the rest of that, which before was revenue going out, and reinvest in other programs. And so I think you gotta look at what are those points of entry that you can then project to say there'll be enough savings here to pay for what we wanna build. And you know, my sense is across the SU, I'm sure that we can find some of those. So any other questions? If not, I have, I have a question. I'm just really interested in learning what stakeholders are looking for. So what is it that they're looking for under their superintendent? And then what would they like the superintendent to prioritize? I just think that's really important as you, know, you start to narrow in well, what are the priorities over the first 100 days. I think I need to hear from all stakeholders about what those are to make an informed decision. I think it's important, I mean, she kind of touched on it a little bit, but to continue to offer enough opportunities for students, and not just one type of student, but all students, um, to keep them interested and wanting to learn and to make sure we're supporting them and directing them so when they graduate, they're able to go on and do whatever it is. I don't know if that definitely has to do with like a personalized learning plan. Um, I know we they're doing that some, but I don't know if everyone is doing that with the whole SU or not, but I definitely like to see a focus on that. Um, and with the budget, you know, right now, I, my concern is we're going to lose some of these opportunities. And with the merger, we were, you know, that was one of the selling points was, we can have all these opportunities for students. And I'm, I do think we did definitely gain some, but then I start hearing we have to cut some. So that definitely concerns me. So I'm hoping to retain, come up with more of what you talked about, what you're doing. I mean, that's awesome. If we could keep kids here and not have them going to VAST or a tech center. Um, but we have to make sure we have those opportunities available to students. And I think you're right about the community. I mean, somebody else thought of the community aspect, but yeah. I mean, growing up, I didn't grow up far from here, but I grew up in a school where we had opportunities for the VAS program to go to college for our senior year. And mm -hmm. I strongly weighed that as something we were going to do, I was going to do, and, and, and I, I didn't do it because I felt so connected to the school. And so I think being able to build that is huge. Um, build that within the school and build that outside of the school. It's a big, a big piece for me. Go ahead, Josephine. I think um, for me, working at the school, having a relationship with the staff, um, being seen, uh, listening, and then being able to, I like your idea that it comes from the bottom up, um, that we don't feel that 
you know, we're so separate. Um, I think that is a huge importance. And I've heard that from other staff and the teachers um, that I have talked to. I think our SU is unique because some of the schools have choice and some don't. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in an ideal world, I would love to see some type of event where people come together from all the schools in the SU and we, you know, we, so that it, it's hard for us because we have a high school and we would love for those students from the other towns in the SU to come to us. And I just, I think that's, again, that's probably building up what we offer at our school, um, community events and stuff, but I would love to see some type of unification with the schools in that school. Okay, I don't necessarily feel that either, yeah. and I'd like to see that happen. Yeah, those familiar faces that, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, there's people five or minutes down the road in another the town. The Sharon right? Academy. Yeah. yeah they're I like, like, wait a minute, where's your kid? You're supposed to be here. And they were like, well, we moved to Zephyr. And I'm right. like, whoa, I totally thought we were going to see him. So, I, yeah, I like, and it's like an extended together. family. I mean, yeah. These are the people, I mean, I grew up in South Burlington. So these are the parents of kids that I went to school with, mm -hmm. thinking, you know, like playing against them in basketball. I can think of right. somebody from Bethel, or um, from Chelsea specifically. Um, and I just, you know, we've always kept in touch. And, and then, you know, now she's so far distant because they're going the other side of the mountain. So drawing those kids and, and keeping, mm -hmm. extending that community, not just South or yeah. Bethel. The whole SU would be mm -hmm. cool to have everybody together draw yeah. those kids. I think a hyper focus on, you know, us looking at what we have to offer here at White River right. for sustainability for this district in regards to promoting that to the other choice towns is important. And it needs to not just be at high school, it needs to be at middle school. Because we have a bunch of, yeah, K-6s that are making decisions come seventh grade. There's a lot of them. And so, um, absolutely, I think that needs to be a focus. And that's, that needs to be a focus. That doesn't just benefit this district. That benefits other districts because we are, we are seeing tuition rates increase rapidly across the state. So if we can keep, keep a decent tu tuition rate here at White River District, that will benefit other sending towns within the SU. I want to add, I totally agree with what Carrie's saying, just being a teacher here. Um, if, if there are initiatives, I really like the ones coming from us up and being supported in that. You know, I always think about, um, right now we're doing an integrated core uh, that we've been able to add on to our schedule where we um, teach classes that don't fall into a core subject. So we've done um, students learning their own interests. So uh, Hannah got to learn how to play the ukulele because that's what she wanted to learn on her own. And with that, we taught all about the brain and how people learn and this and that. Right now, we're doing one on a book on um, a, by a Vermont author called The Benefits of Being an Octopus. And all the kids get a copy of the book. They really enjoy it. We talk about it. We have great discussions. Um, but it was it's hard for any teacher when you're getting someone else's lesson and teach those with enthusiasm or with um, authenticity. First, you don't really know it too well, or you're, it's not something you're excited about or energized by. So I hope that with any initiatives that do come down, because it happens in every district I've been in, initiatives come down from the district and you're in charge of doing these things, but it's hard. It's not, not, not just because you don't care. You, you don't always understand the reason behind it. Sometimes it really just doesn't make sense. Other times it's um, maybe not in your wheelhouse and you're, you're, you don't have a lot of the conversation. So I would love to see you know, the connection between central office and here, and not to like, You've been in all these, you're a teacher and a principal, like not to just have meetings for the sake of meetings, but to have real authentic, maybe coming to our spaces where the poor teachers are, as opposed to having every teacher in one space where it's really easy to be, it's like kids distracted, um, or whatever else, you have so many other things in your mind, but coming and having those conversations at our, at our tables where we meet and have conversations to really help us to understand and feel excited about it and process, ask questions, and feel confident. And like you said, I think that makes it way more efficient as far as um, making a, a program successful. So I hope that with anything that is coming district down or SU in um, is, is 
brought it on a smaller scale to have those authentic conversations before implementing anything. And I think one of the things that I, why I think your literacy has been so successful, that launch is that it's provided with professional learning and constant feedback, right? There's a feedback loop. We're and so, in on a regular yeah, basis and, and so teachers, anything that we were going to do system wide like that would require that type of embedded coaching. Yeah. You know, it can't be a two day in service and say we're good. Like, it needs constant feedback and focus. Utilizing the in service. I mean, in all honesty, the you know, beginning of the in service. We're required to go as Paris, but it didn't pertain to us. It didn't pertain to what we're doing. And so I think that, like, sometimes breaking it down a little bit further, so giving me the tool to do my job better, not just, I mean, just, I'm here for my day. I want to learn. I want to be able to reach these children that I'm but I need more tools to do that. So utilizing those days that that we have with the training and, and pertaining to specifics. It's been really beneficial with Mary Ellen um, giving us opportunity to work as a middle school uh, break down even more and decide what it is that's important for us to be learning out, working on developing and that's allowed us to do really amazing things. So we've been able to work with Scott Thompson from the Parent Institute um, each time we have an in-service and I felt like that's made for every middle school teacher made it feel like it's a lot more of a productive use of our time than the, than the times that happens where we're all sitting on the bleachers watching something um, and it, you, know, you start to wonder about how, how beneficial or useful it may be. So we're thankful for that. Anything else? Good luck. Yeah, I'm excited. You sure? <laughs> well, I, I will. I will say this. I will. I, and I've said it a few times. As I've toured the SU today, I was unbelievably impressed with the work that's happening, and so that's exciting. Um, you know, I think if I'm selected to be the superintendent, the work starts sooner rather than later, and I'm excited about that. And know that I go in this with eyes wide open, that there's a great deal of work to do, and that this position is very vast in the sense of it's a large SU. It hits three counties, there's 10 towns, there's eight schools, and there's seven boards. And so with that, I am all about how do you build an efficient team that helps get the work done. Jamie doesn't think he's going to do all the work, right? That's not possible, not to do it well. And so know that I would, I'm going to be looking at to utilize folks' strengths, and that may mean folks doing some things right now that they're not even doing, potentially as we get down the line, to best utilize strengths of the folks we have to get the work done. And so know that I do go in this eyes wide open understanding it's a big position and a big job and that I know Jamie alone's not going to get anything done, and that it has to be a we, and it has to be a team. All right. I don't have, I don't have anything thank else. You. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yeah.